Okay, welcome to the new unit on um, circular motion and gravitation. So uh, basically, for this unit, we're going to mostly focus on um, a special case of kinematics and dynamics known as uniform circular motion. Um, so imagine for a second you've got an object um, uh, and you're just twirling like a mass on a string and you're spinning it around in a circle, like a horizontal circle above your head. And you're doing this at a constant speed. Well, you'll remember that speed we define simply as the distance traveled in a certain amount of time. Well, if we look at circular motion, instead of looking at time period as being any given time period, we're going to focus on the period of motion, capital T, where that is the um, time it takes to complete one revolution. If you think about going in a complete circle, think about a mass traveling in a one complete circle, the distance traveled in that time really is the circumference. And the circumference of the circle, um, you'll recall, is 2 pi r. So um, we travel one circumference for every period of rotation. Um, so the circumference, of course, as we said, is 2 pi r. And that means that the speed of an object in uniform circular motion we can define as 2 pi r divided by capital T, or the period. Now, a good point uh, to make is that this is uniform motion. And what we mean by uniform is that um, it's traveling at a constant speed. It's not speeding up or slowing down. So if a plane makes a complete circle of radius uh, 3,622 meters in 2.1 minutes, what is the speed of the plane? Well, we know that speed is simply 2 pi r over t. And so this is 2 pi times the radius of 3622 divided by the time period, which would be 2.1 seconds times 6, or sorry, 2.1 minutes times 60 seconds in a minute. And this works out to be about 181 meters per second. So that tells us about the speed. And like we said, if it's in uniform circular motion, then it's not speeding up or slowing down. But even though the speed is constant, is the mass accelerating? Um, You'll recall that we defined acceleration as not just a change in speed, but a change in velocity over time. So acceleration is very much a vector. And so it's really the question of a change in velocity with respect to time. If we have an object traveling in a circle, okay, imagine it traveling in a circle at different points around the circle, and suppose that it's traveling in a, in a counterclockwise direction. Well, the velocity at any given instant might look like this might be going this way at this instant and this way at this time and, and this way at this time. And it's going to travel around and around in a circle. It's going to continue around that circle. You'll notice that the direction of the velocity at any time is tangent to the circle. And by that we mean um, it, it just it's like a, a straight line that touches the circle at exactly one point. If you were to twirl around uh, a mass on a string, around and around, if you were to let go in this instant right here, if you were to let go, then the mass would just fly off in a straight line in that direction, consistent with Newton's first law. Now, as it turns out, as this goes around in a circle, we mentioned that it is in fact accelerating, and the direction of that acceleration might be somewhat surprisingly inwards. So while the velocity at any point um, around the circle is tangent to the circle, the acceleration is towards the center um, along the radius. Note that this means that the velocity and acceleration are perpendicular to each other. You might recall from kinematics and dynamics we looked at earlier that perpendicular vectors are independent. And so the net result of this is that this acceleration vector can change the direction of this velocity but it can't change the length of that vector, which is to say that it can change which way the arrow is pointing, but it doesn't change the speed. And so even though it may be traveling at a constant speed, anything traveling in a circular path is accelerating. And it's accelerating because the direction of the velocity is changing. And it's always changing. In any given instant, it's going to be moving in a slightly different direction than it was the instant before. So to calculate the acceleration of an object in uniform circular motion, we can say the acceleration, in, uh, the centripetal acceleration, I should say, is equal to v squared divided by r. Now, you recall that we defined v in a circle as being 2 pi r over t. Uh, if I substitute this in here for v, I get a somewhat messy result. If I square this and cancel out my r's, I get 4 
pi squared r over t squared. Um, at first glance, just a couple of things to kind of keep in mind if you're going to use this version of the formula. The first is that uh, pi is squared, and that seems very strange. Uh, the second is that r is not. So r is kind of the only value in there that's not squared. But if you look closely, you can see the units here are going to be meters divided by seconds squared. So that is, in fact, the right um, formula. Now, there is a derivation we can do for this. Uh, I think we'll save that for class because it's a little bit complex, and I'm not sure it'll really hold up well on video. So let's, um, let's just keep on moving. So whenever an object is accelerating, you'll recall from, um, from Newton's second law, there must be a net force. And the net force is going to equal mass times acceleration. The thing about centripetal motion, that is to say, anytime any object is moving in a circle, there is a net force acting on it, is we call this net force, we give it a special name, which is centripetal force, or FC. What you need to recognize is that that is the exact same as this net force that you know and love from other dynamics you've learned about. So when we say that FC equals MAC, this FC is not some new force that we're talking about all of a sudden. It's not a new force like gravity or friction or tension or electric or magnetic forces or anything like that. It really just is a net force. So there's not one formula for FC, just like there's not one formula for F net. You have to look at the situation and decide what's providing that centripetal force in each case. So an example of this, so we've got three examples here. A mass is uh, tied to the end of a string and it's being whirled in a circle. The centripetal force in this case would be provided by the tension, the tension in the, in the line. If a car is driving on the highway and it drives around in a circle, um, the reason it's able to turn in a circle and not just slide out and continue in a straight line is because there is a friction force between the tires and the road. And last but not least, as the moon orbits around the Earth, the reason it continues to move in a somewhat circular path around the Earth is because there's a centripetal force, and this centripetal force is provided by gravity. So the key aspect there is to recognize that in any given situation, the centripetal force can come from a number of different locations. Sometimes it's one force, like tension, friction, or gravity. Sometimes it's multiple forces. We're going to look at a, just a couple of examples here where the centripetal force is provided by just one. Uh, one external force. Remember um, from Newton's second law that um, FC equals MAC, and so that means that FC could be defined as MV squared over R, or FC could equal M for pi squared R over T squared. Now the versions of these formulas that you're going to use are just going to depend on the information given at that particular time. So, imagine this situation. Uh, a 0.5 kilogram mass sits on a frictionless table and is attached to a hanging weight. The mass is whirled in a circle of radius 0.2 meters at 2.3 meters per second. Um, that's a little bit difficult to visualize, so let's take a look at this picture here. We've got this blue mass on the table that's whirling around in a circle, and it's attached by a string to the red mass that's hanging down. Now, of course, if this blue mass, if you were to grab it and stop it, and, and just hold on to it for a second, and then let it go, of course, what would happen is the blue mass would fall, the red mass would fall, and this whole system would kind of stop. Uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't stay in equilibrium like it is now. But if you throw this blue mass at just the right speed, and it's traveling at just the right speed around just the right circle, we could imagine a situation where this red mass is actually held motionless. And this is a strange situation because half of it is in equilibrium. Like this red mass here is very much in equilibrium, which is to say not accelerating, whereas the other half of the system, this blue mass going in a circle, is accelerating because it's traveling around and around in a circle. So, <clears throat> first step is to draw a quick picture of what's going on there. I've got one mass hanging and one mass on the table attached by a rope. And again, this is the mass that's kind of traveling around in a circle. Um, it might be helpful just to label these. For example, maybe I'll call this FG1 whereas this has a force of gravity, Fg2. Um, there'd be some other forces here, like a tension pulling up on the rope here, as well as a tension pulling inwards here. Uh, I guess the mass sitting on the table would also have a, a normal force upwards supporting it. So calculate the centripetal force acting on the mass. We know that Fc 
is going to equal mv squared over r. And so this is going to equal 0 0.5 times 2.3 squared divided by 0 0.20. And this works out to be right around 13.3 newtons. So it's 13.3 newtons of centripetal force on this, this mass that's moving in a circle. That's how much force it takes to keep it moving in a circle. But the second question here says, what is the mass of the hanging weight? So really, what is the mass here? What is M1 of this hanging weight? Um, it's important to kind of realize what's going on here, which is that as this mass moves in a circle, as M2 moves around and around a circle, it's being accelerated by this tension force. If you cut the rope, then this would fly off in a straight line and wouldn't move in a circle anymore. This tension force must be equal to this tension force because that's how tension works. It's an internal force where those two will be equal. But since this mass here is hanging freely and not accelerating up or down, then this tension force must also be equal to this weight. So we have this situation where the weight of this ma hanging mass here is really providing the centripetal force for the other mass to move in a circle. And so what we get is Fc is equal to Fg1, and Fg1 is just equal to M1g. So solving for M1, it'd just be Fg1 over g, that's 13.3 newtons divided by 9.8, which gives me right around 1.3 by kilograms. All right, let's take a look at another example here. So we've got a car traveling at 14 meters per second, traveling around an unbanked curve in the road that has a radius of 96 meters. Now by unbanked curve in the road, I just mean that um, you can imagine on some racetracks and things, the road isn't flat. They actually, it goes up on a bank so that cars can travel more quickly around the corner. But if this road is flat, um, what is the centripetal acceleration of the car? Now again, I think it's worth um, having a quick look at a picture here to help us understand what's going on. As a car drives around and around in a circle, there's a number of forces at work. There's, of course, gravity and normal force uh, opposing each other. But what pulls it in towards the center of that circle is the friction force. So as it travels around and around, there's a friction force inwards that allows it to keep moving in a circle. You can imagine if this car hit a particularly icy patch all of a sudden, and there wasn't enough friction to keep it moving in a circle, that it would just slide out and continue in a straight line. So again, like we always do, let's start off with a free body diagram of this situation so we can better understand it. I got a force of gravity down, I have my normal force upwards, and then I have a friction force inwards. Now it's important to notice when you look at this picture, it really looks like this object is accelerating, and it is accelerating. It's not speeding up or slowing down, but it's very much accelerating inwards towards the center of that circle as it travels around and around. So the centripetal acceleration is going to equal v squared over r, which is 14 squared over 96, which works out to be right around 2.04 meters per second squared. So what is the minimum coefficient of friction between the road and the car's tires? How much grip do the tires have to have in order for this car to keep on moving? Well, it's important, and I think moving forward, what you're gonna wanna get used to is just like we did with net forces, where we always said, okay, what is the net force in this situation? We're gonna ask ourselves, what is the centripetal force? And in this case, the centripetal force is friction. So this is a really important statement to kind of start off with. Now, um, note that I don't know the mass of the car or anything like that, but we'll see what happens when we substitute our values. The centripetal force is gonna be mass times centripetal acceleration. And the force of friction, of course, is mu times Fn. Well, in this particular case, because the road is not banked, the normal force and the force of gravity are gonna be the same. So mac will equal mu times m times g. And lo and behold, the masses on both sides cancel out. And long story short, we can solve for mu because it'll simply equal the ratio of centripetal acceleration to um, acceleration due to gravity. So 2.04 divided by 9.8, which gives me right around 0 0.2. And of course, there are no units for mu. Now, last thing we want to think about uh, before we uh, move on from centripetal forces is this idea of uh, centrifugal force. You might have heard of centripetal or centrifugal force. Well, centripetal means center seeking, as in the force is towards the center of the circle. Centrifugal means center fleeing. 
Now really, centrifugal force is really an apparent force. And by that I mean, if you're driving in a car, as you go around a corner, it certainly doesn't feel like you're being pulled inwards. It feels like you're being thrown outwards. Um, while it may feel like that, the reality is that the force is actually acting inwards. What you're feeling is sort of just a result of Newton's first law which is really just the inertia that you feel wanting to keep you moving in a straight line, okay? So centrifugal force really, when you experience that, you're really just feeling inertia. All right, that's it for the first set of notes.